Episode 192 of CPP Cast with guest Gal Zabam, recorded March 28th, 2019. The sponsor of this episode of CPP Cast is PVS Studio. PVS Studio is a static application security testing tool for detecting errors and potential vulnerabilities in the source code of programs written in C, 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 Sharp, and Java. In this episode, we discuss client updates and the least secure programming language. Then we'll talk to security researcher Gal Spahn. Gal talks to us about reverse engineering C++. Welcome to episode 192 of CPP Cast, the first podcast for C developers by C developers. I'm your host, Rob Irving, joined by my co host, Jason Turner. Jason, how are you doing today? All right, Rob, how are you doing? Doing okay. Uh, you know, recovering from some travel. Was at the uh, Microsoft Summit last week. Right. How'd that go? It was good. Uh, I got to hang out with Simon Brand, who's now like the visual C community guy over there and evangelist uh, effectively yeah, evangelist something like that and uh yeah did a nice episode with him and uh marion luperu and um tara raj and bob brown cool cool you've been busy with everything yes i mean <laughs> it's tax season and i have a bunch of travel coming up and then yeah. well a couple of conferences and yeah definitely been staying busy okay well, at the top of our episode, I'd like to read a piece of feedback. Um, this week, we got an email from Sebastian, and he says, Hey, first of all, great podcast. You're doing a great job of interviewing interesting people and coming up with news I didn't get time to follow, and getting that during my sport or commute is great. And then he does say he has one complaint, which is mm. the intro music is way too loud. And he says that he listens to a lot of other podcasts, but ours is the only one where he has to lower the volume temporarily to avoid ear damage. So I, I'm surprised. I've never heard this complaint before. Have you? Uh, no, I've never seen it come up, but um, it's easy to believe. I mean, if the music yeah. is jarring at a different level or something, you just, I don't know, have oh. to normalize it across it or something later. Well, I do. I normalize everything. So there's at least parts of the entire audio track that I thought got as loud as the intro music. Mm. But maybe I can bring the intro music itself just down a little bit. I'll, I'll yeah. take a look at it with the editing for this episode and uh, see what I can do. Yeah, no, I sure there's yeah, if you can. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for the, the feedback, Sebastian. Uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts about the show as well. You can always reach out to us on Facebook, Twitter, or email us at feedback at cpcast.com. And don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes. Joining us today is Gal Zaban. Gal is currently working as a security researcher. Her passion is reverse engineering with a particular interest in C++ code. In her spare time, when not delving into low-level research, she designs and sews her own clothes and loves to play the clarinet. Gal, welcome to the show. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. I have got to ask you some questions about the designing and sewing of your own clothes. I, <laughs> I go to um, sewing expos with my wife uh, at least once a year or so, and I've noticed that the... The sewing machines that are sold today are, I mean, they're geeky toys just like any other expo that I go to. They've got touch screens and embroidery systems, and you can program them and upload files. And Like, do you get into that side of things also? So actually, researching a sewing machine is stuff that I didn't do until now. When, you, when I mean research, I mean like take them apart, look at the code, and start to find vulnerabilities in them. Right. <laughs> but, yes, I know that there is lots of gadgets for those things. It's kind of funny how a hobby can be that uh, extensive when you talk about those things. Um, so, But I think that the most important thing is the fabric choosing. So you need to choose, lot, you have lots of options and a lot of patterns. And actually, this is the hardest part in sewing clothes, in my opinion. <laughs> right. So the actual design of the clothing itself, in other words. 
Yes, exactly. Yeah. My wife does a lot of sewing. Uh, I don't. She's only made a few things completely from scratch, but pretty much modifies nearly everything that she buys. I can understand that. It's really uh, it saves you like time to go to some expert that could do it for you, and actually you can personalize everything that you have to make it prettier and your own. Right. Okay. Well, Gal, we got a couple news articles to discuss. Uh, feel free to comment on any of these, and then we'll start talking more about your research and re- reverse engineering. Okay. Sounds great. Okay. So first, uh, LVM Clang 8.0 was released. Uh, and I don't know a whole lot about LVM. Jason, do you have a chance to read through all these change logs? Oh, goodness. Uh, I looked a through, I looked through the Clang side. I didn't look through the LVM side specifically. Um, and then I also cross referenced it with the cbpreference.com list of compiler support to see what C20 things we got in Clang mm-hmm. 8. Okay. And there's a few things that stand out, such as Constexpr algorithm. Oh, okay. It is the first shipping vendor with Constexpr algorithm support. So nice. that's cool. Yeah. Um, that was the main thing that stood out. To was me that, on that the one. the first C20 feature? Were there any others? Uh, in there? Oh, yeah, yeah. There's several others. Constexpert try catch blocks, uh, nested inline namespaces. Pro- this one's particularly fun. Prohibiting aggregates with user declared constructor- constructors. Okay. Now, this, it's, it's considered a design flaw. And right. I've, I'll, I'll go a quick overview of this from the listener's perspective here. If you have a, uh, class that's got public members, or struct, whatever, with public members, and you declare a user-defined default constructor or whatever, right? It is possible to still do aggregate initialization of those public members and bypass the constructor effectively. As of C++17, C++20 plugged that that issue. And it's kind of goofy. This is the kind of thing that ends up as a Twitter poll, basically. Right. So uh, that that's, yeah... That's a thing that's been fixed. Um, and then a few other like default and constructible stateless, uh, default constructible and assignable stateless lambdas, uh, range based for init statements. So just like if init and switch init statements that we got in C17, range based for loops now have that as well, which starts to become a little bit confusing with how many different ways it's possible to construct a for loop. But yeah, they've got a lot going on. And the uh, spaceship operator partial support. Nice, nice. Oh, and also there's a bunch of sanitizer work here for uh, implicit conversion sanitizer, cool. which I'm going to have to spend some time playing with that one. Yeah. Well, it's great to see that they're already doing so much C20 work when the ink isn't even dry on the uh, standard. Yes. Okay. Uh, next, we have some conference news uh, C Now. The keynote was announced, and it's going to be a guest we've had on the show before, uh, Hannah Dushkova who talked about compile time, regular expressions. And that's yes. what he, her keynote will be on. And it's it's had some updates since her CppCon talk and since we had her on. Um, so she'll be presenting some new material um, from updating the library, which uh, she's been continuing to work on. Yes, and I have to give her serious like props for this because she keeps giving, uh, like at, at many conferences, has given a talk called Compile Time, Regular Expressions. Right. But it's always new material. Yeah, I mean, I, I think even when we had her on, she said it was like the fifth iteration of the library. So I guess maybe she's up to her sixth now. Uh, it, I'm like sure that. at least, at yeah. least the sixth, yeah. I guess it will also be interesting to see her talk in Call CPP in May. That's right. She will be giving a talk with a similar name then, and I expect that there will be more updates again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, was there some other conference news you want to go over, Jason? Uh, just in general, we've got C++ Now coming up. We haven't talked about it a lot, and that's probably partially my fault because I'm not planning to go, so I haven't been talking about it. Right, because it's back-to-back uh, back with Core C++, right? Uh, yeah, it would be just complicated for me. It's between some work trips and then right up against with Core C++, yeah. Right. But that's May 5th through the 10th. It's coming up in Aspen. It looks like a great lineup, of course, every year. They did announce the schedule, and... Um, we, I think they announced the schedule, right? Yes, the 2019 schedule is online now. Yes. And uh, the tickets are available. It's always a great conference. You should definitely go. Uh, anything, anything else with conference news? 
Uh, I don't know. Let's see. Core C++, that's coming up, of course, which our guest will be speaking at, which is... Do you have anything that you would like to say about Core C++, Gal? Um, I'm really looking forward for Core CPP. It actually will be my first conference that I'm going to present for developers and not for security researchers. Hmm. Um, and I guess you will see my talk then. Uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> Yep, I'm looking forward for this too. <laughs> so that's uh, May 14th, 15th, and 16th for those who are listening but haven't checked that out yet. There's definitely still time to buy tickets, and that's in Tel Aviv. Okay, and then a couple more things uh, in the news. There's this new uh, name of operator. It's called an operator, but it's, it's a library. And uh, it does, you know gets you the name of functions, variables, class types, pretty much anything. There seems to be a, a name of macro uh, in this little header-only library. It seems pretty cool. Yeah, it, it doesn't even, uh, I don't know, seem like it should be possible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I didn't go into the guts of the code to see how he does it with everything. Did you take a look at it? I did start reading through the code. The main thing that I noticed is that it is super, super clean. Yeah. Um, it's like fully const expert, no except correct. Uh, it's, and everything is just like nice and organized and, um, and it's tiny. It's a tiny library, 285 lines of code. It's a lot of functionality out of 285 lines of code. Yeah. Yeah, and it looks like it runs on uh, C Visual C++, GCC, and Clang, so it's nice. Yeah, just a tiny bit of uh, compiler-specific glue in here for sucking out the names of these things. Yeah, definitely seems like the, the type of thing that would be nice to get standardized. Yeah, I mean, reflections, yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's its own thing. Hopefully it'll come soon. Uh, and then the last thing is we have this short article about the three least secure programming languages. And I was very happy to see C++ was not at the top of this list. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only reason I put this on yeah, yeah. the we, news list. It, it, it's called the, the le three least, but it does give you the top seven. And we are in the top seven. But uh, the in order, it's C, PHP, Java, JavaScript, Python, C++, and then Ruby. I guess that one of the reasons that CPP is that low is not necessarily because it's more secure than all the others in significantly. Just because most of the, there is a lot of big projects and big um, code at that written in C, for example. And this is one of the reasons that you can see C up on the top with almost 50%. Yeah. Um, also, some of the things that I think is that because um, the, re the report is only about open source code, there is also a lot of closed source code that is being researched mm. and is not concluded in this report. Okay. And C++ has a, quite a, in general, about like, closed source and not this specific report, it has lots of um, complexity if you compare it to C. And actually, C is quite a known language that a lot of people uh, prefer researching instead of C++. Right. So maybe it explains some of the reasons um, why C has so many vulnerabilities in this report instead uh, of other languages and why C++ is that low. Yeah, I mean, I guess like if you take you know, critically visible projects like OpenSSL, which are written in pure C, and if they have a couple of CVEs against them, then that becomes a really big deal. Yeah. I also, I read the Slashdot discussion on this, and it's been a very long time since I've programmed in PHP, and PHP is listed as number two here. But apparently, there's like so many gotchas in PHP, you have to know the language really intimately to avoid writing security flaws. Hmm. Um, but I don't know. I haven't spent a lot of time with it in a long time. Yeah. Also, this report shows uh, 10 years of uh, CVs that were found. So you might also want to take it under consideration when you look at this report. Right. Right. Okay. Well, since we're, we're talking about security, uh, maybe you should move on to uh, the, the interview. So, Gal, you're a security researcher, and your focus is on reverse engineering so can you tell us a little bit more about what exactly reverse engineering is? 
Yes, um, reverse engineering is a process when you take a binary, uh, usually a binary, but it can also be um, uh, when you take a binary and try to understand the logic of the code that was written um, at the beginning. When you take uh, some, it's what I do is specifically for software, but you can also do it for hardware. When you take a a machine, you take a compiled code, and then you try to um, understand the source, how the source was written, how everything was built at the beginning, what the developer really wanted to write. Um, so this is in general how reversing, uh, what reversing is. Okay. So what? Uh, why? Why reverse engineer a program? So there is some reasons why someone would like to reverse a program. I'm going to focus on the software side. Um, so you have the, the ethical reasons. If you want to protect a product, if you want to make sure you have no vulnerabilities. So in some cases, you would like to research and reverse engineer code that you don't have its source. Um, then you can reverse engineer, find vulnerabilities, and then record them to the vendor that is responsible for them. Okay. So this is one of the reasons and one of the things you can do with reversing. Actually understand the logic to protect uh, code. Other reasons can be less, um, let's say it's legal, <laughs> but <laughs> so you can... White hat versus black hat reasons, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. You have people who reverse code in order to find vulnerability, extra them to create arm to some product. You can do it to understand logic and steal the logic of some uh, products too. So you can use reversing for good and for bad, but it's a really uh, strong tool for people because you not normally developers just give them their code for uh, extremely critical machines. You usually have to reverse it and understand it by your own. So even if you want to um, understand the code to protect it, some cases you just have to reverse it. Because I don't think that Linux is open source, and but Windows, if you want to research and understand it, you have to reverse code and to protect stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. That got me wondering, like, is there any advantage to reversing your own code that you already know the source code to? Like, can you learn different things about a project that way? So sometimes when you want to debug your code, you can use, you can do reverse, you can debug the reversed code. I mean, like, if you write drivers, sometimes you have some um, very hard uh, bugs to fix when you look at the source only. And sometimes you need to combine between looking at the source and looking at the assembly code that actually run. Um, and this is one of the reasons that you would you would reverse your code even though you have the source. Um, other reasons can be optimization sometimes, or maybe if you want to understand better how exactly what you do um uh, what it actually does. Um, so this is some of the reasons that I would think that even if you have the source, you would reverse the code. Okay. How good does the reverse engineered code typically look? Like if you're comparing the output of a reverse engineered assembly to, you know, the source code you started with, like, is it recognizable? It is recognizable. You can really understand. There is some of the things that after you compile the code are not there anymore, especially when you if you don't compile uh, with symbols. So you don't have the parameters, you don't have the names, but you have all the structures. You can understand them by reversing the code. It might take you more time if you are not experienced with it, but afterwards, everything that is written, you have a compiler at the middle that creates assembly code and it has patterns that it usually... Um, that it, you, you can see, and also you have a uh, logic you can understand by by it. So if the debug symbols are in there, then you can at least potentially get the names of the variables and the names of the functions and that kind of thing that are being called. Yes. So if you have debug symbols, so I can actually see a lot of those things that um, you write as a developer. You have more names. You sometimes have debug strings that are compiled um, when you don't do the 
when you don't we see, when you compile with the debug. Um, but actually, you can see more stuff when a program is compiled in debug mode. So I'm wondering this as I'm thinking about this more. Like, uh, do you uh, was are there countermeasures that make it more difficult for your code to be reverse engineered? Um, yes, there is stuff. <laughs> there is a lot of stuff actually that makes a reverse engineer job harder. Okay. Yeah. Uh, some stuff that's called anti-debugging that you can add to your codes to prevent people like us to reverse it. Anti-debugging? Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You can do a lot of stuff to make the reverse job harder. Anti-debugging is one of the options, but it only helps the, that just make the process longer. It doesn't, Always, just it cannot prevent people from reversing. It can only make the process longer. Right. For them to add a uh, lot of functionalities, just confuse reverses, and sometimes you have obfuscation stuff like this. That though, and and all of those things at the end just uh, stall the process, but do not prevent it. So. I mean, as a security researcher, I'm, I'm assuming your job is more often you reverse engineering the code. But I'm just wondering, like, would you ever make a recommendation to, I don't know, like, I'm thinking about, like, voting systems. Voting systems, like, everyone's talking about voting systems and what vulnerabilities they have and, and questioning, you know, whether or not we should be using electronic voting and whatever. Like, should the voting system vendors apply these anti-debugging countermeasures or whatever to their source code so that it's harder for someone to crack or should they not like is there any real advantage to that so there is advantage because usually just the per the purpose of anti-debugging is just to stall the process you can see it for example in video games when you want someone to not reverse and publish a uh, code in order to sell more. So in these election systems, it's quite useful because it will take more time. I'm not sure that it will, one it cannot 100% prevent, prevent people from doing so, but it might stall them enough so uh, the process at the end will be okay. okay. But nothing can be 100% um, percent secure. Okay. I wanted to interrupt the discussion for just a moment to bring you a word from our sponsors. PVS Studio performs static code analysis and issues warnings for fragments of code that are likely to contain errors and potential vulnerabilities. The tool supports the C, C++, C Sharp, and Java programming languages. At the moment, PVS Studio has 422 diagnostics for C and C++, which enable you to detect dereferencing of null pointers, array bound violations, typos, dead code, resource leaks, and other kinds of errors. PVS Studio supports working with Visual C++, GCC, client compilers, as well as a number of compilers for embedded systems. The analyzer works in the Windows, Linux, and Mac OS environments. Follow the links in the description to two new posts from the PVS Studio team. The first one suggests checking your skills to find errors. For the second one, you can read about a non-obvious case of an analyzer false positive. One thing I'm curious about is... Um... How does C++ compare to other languages with reverse engineering? Is it easier or more difficult to reverse engineer a C++ library or application? So C++ is quite hard to reverse, okay. um, especially when you compare it to um, other languages, because C++ has uh, virtualization and objects and a lot of, a lot of concepts. Uh, actually, every few years there is a new, um, there is new concepts every time, and it's quite hard to understand uh, the code itself. Because, um, for example, if we take a virtualization and virtual calls uh, specifically, so as a reversal, you cannot see uh, in the code after a compilation exactly what will be called. You can only see that it's calling a register in the memory. And then only on runtime you can understand what uh, the functions that, what is the functions that were called. And this is uh, quite complicated. And um, also you have all the objects and inheritance that are quite hard to understand. Uh, it takes a lot of time, basically. And it really makes the process a bit different. You need to understand a lot of the, um, 
I don't know if to call it metadata, but it's like you need to understand the, the objects and everything around the code and not only the logic itself. Okay. So this is uh, what you'll be talking about at your course C++ talk, right? Yes, exactly. So I'm going to show, because this talk is going to be um, a focus for developers, I'm going to show some of the stuff that might interest more developers than security researchers. Because when you develop code, you, you're not always, you don't always think about how it really, com what it looks like at the end, how it's compiled, what it's compiled to. So I'm going to show some basic stuff and I'm going to show some complex stuff about how the code that you write really looks like in the assembly. What you can understand as a security researcher, like how do I look at C++ code and what makes my job easier and my what is just complicating stuff. And actually, I think that it will show uh, some of the developers that doesn't know about uh, those concepts, how, the, how all the stuff that you write is really looks like at the end. All right. Can you tell us a little bit more about um, the tools that you use when reverse engineering C++? So developing C++, in general, there is, uh, you need to um, divide it into a few uh, processes. The first is the um, a disassembler, which actually converts the binary itself to some kind of an assembly language. And then you have a, a few options for this. Um one of the thing is the most um, the most like the tool that I use the most is uh, Ida, which is Ida Pro, which is a tool that helps disassemble and also uh, to decompile some of the code. And um, so if this is how what um I talk about at the first part about disassembling. C++ itself has some there is some tools that was written by uh, by uh, researchers and security researchers uh, specifically, that helps understand the object and inheritance, and some of them also about the virtualization. Um, also, universities are quite into the subject of understanding C++ and reversing them in the and understanding objects after compilation. So there is also some articles that were written. Um, but generally, there isn't lots of tools in the subject because all of them requires more work afterward. You cannot just run a tool and then get all the information you need. You use the tool and then you need to work on it more. So this is the main problem of CPP. You don't have like an easy one-click solution. Okay, so yeah, I, I have actually used a, a .NET decompiler and you can just take a DLL and drop it into there and even without symbols, it'll like you know, output some source code for you to look at. So you're saying with C++, it takes a lot more work than that. Yeah, because .NET is has bytecode and right. C++ is compiled to, um, is, is a compiled language that doesn't have a bytecode. So when you use .NET and then you use all the um, decompilers that you have for it, the job is much um, different. And this is why you could also see all the variables and the names and everything. In C++, it's, it's different. So are any of those tools that you mentioned freely available, or are they commercial projects? So there is a lot of script that's written in IDA Python for IDA. IDA is not an open source tool. Okay. Um, you have other alternatives that are open source. There is also the new uh, tool uh, that was released by the NSA now um, called uh, Gahida, and, and you have other options for IDA, but if you speak about specifically tools for C++, so some of the tools are uh, open source. A lot of scripts and IDA Python scripts were written to help this problem. Um, so this is basically what you have now. All right. I'm curious, uh, as you've been working with reverse debugging, and I'm just, uh, or reverse engineering, excuse me, thinking about it from a programmer's perspective, have you ever come across something that like had to be a compiler bug, like the compiler generated incorrect code here for the source code that it was given? You mean the compiler will had a bug that created vulnerabilities? Yeah, uh, create vulnerabilities or just incorrect code somehow. Like I don't know. 
I don't even have a great so example, but there is vulnerabilities also in compilers and stuff, but it's not something that I've done before. Okay. I just thought with potentially spending that much time staring at assembly or, or disassembly that you would have, I don't know, I come usually, across. I usually look at assembly and not the source. So I don't, I usually don't have both. So we cannot compare. I can only see what I have in the assembly. So if there was a source that was compiled in wrongly, so I could not know that because I don't have the source itself. So could you spend some time, are you able to spend some time talking about what your actual day-to-day -day job looks like? Yeah, sure. So actually what I do in my job is that I take binaries and firmwares and actually try to understand and find vulnerabilities in them to look for some flaws in the in the behavior of the code or look for to find flaws and that cause uh, memory corruptions um, and then try to understand if they are exploitable or not and sometimes I exploit for them um, so this is what I do and the day today job is quite frustrating and not that uh, and not like it sounds like reversing as, as a concept it's really hard and really takes a lot of time. If you have one function, you can look at it for days and you can look at it for months and you can start code for a long, long time before even finding something. So it's quite fascinating to be a reverse engineer at the end. I really enjoy it. I cannot complain at all because I love my job. But at the end, it's, you usually have lots of frustration. You fail a lot as a security researcher because you try to find bugs in someone else's code when you don't have the code itself. Mm -hmm. So you have the process of reversing the code, which takes a long time, and you have the, the process of finding vulnerabilities, which is hard by itself. So all of these processes is quite hard. So you usually fail a lot look at stuff and just all the vulnerabilities just pop out of the code. It takes, it takes a long time to find stuff. So are you hired by the company that wrote the code in the first place? Yes. Okay. okay. So it's not, it's all like to, I do research to protect the product and to uh, find stuff to make the product better. Um, but you have, but you have still a lot of uh, work because sometimes you don't want to have the source and look at the source. You want to look at from the other side, the red team side um, perspective when you try to attack something to protect it. Have you, uh, for the fun of it, like not as part of work, done any of the um, uh, bug bounty kind of like, you know, find a security vulnerability in Chrome and get a payback kind of thing? So... I um, sometimes look at those stuff, but I'm not uh, really doing a lot of bug bounties. Um, I try it in my spare time when I'm not working on, on vulnerabilities to actually focus on the reverse engineering itself. I really like the process, and I really think that there is a lot of methods for reverse engineering that should be um, automated, and some of them should be... Um, should be taking more. I, I just really like reverse engineering in generally. So sometimes I do uh, some stuff to make my day-to-day -day job uh, more automated because there is always stuff to do. And also I really like to write a tool for reverting C++ as uh, I already presented about. Um, so some in my in my spare time I usually focus on that and not on bug bounties. Try to do some. Um, to actually focus on the reverse engineering itself. Do you want to tell us some more about some of these tools that you've worked on? So um, one of the big uh, tools that I've written is uh, Virtuella, which is an open source tool uh, written in Ida Python. And this tool actually helps for reverse engineer to work on C++ code. So what it does, it's actually... As I said before, one of the biggest problems that we have is that we sometimes have virtual code in our code. And then we have problems to understand who, who's, what function is being called. Because what you see is usually a call for a register, which is not really useful when you have uh, the code without running it. 
So you usually have ending up with running the code and executing it and lots of time just to understand a lot of the options that this virtual call can have. And the, what I made is a tool that can, on runtime, create a connection between the virtual call and the function and also uh, helps creating structures and other comments on the assembly code so you can reverse it statically later. Because like there is two options for reversing code. You have the static option when you just have the assembly. You read the assembly, you understand the logic, and you also have the dynamic option which you run the code, you understand stuff while the code is being executed. And this option is more time consuming than just statically look at assembly. So what I did is to try to minimize the um, the dynamic reversing of C++ and actually creating the structures and the, and understanding the virtual call. Um, so you could afterwards reverse it and look at it statically. That sounds pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> I hope that people will find it useful as I found it. I, I believe I found your GitHub project here and was just looking at the... Uh screenshots that you have of, of mm -hmm. some of the things going on. Yeah, so I, my code is on GitHub. So you can find also some screenshots of the functionalities that the tool does. Um, some of it is creating structures, some of it is adding access to the code, so you can find your functions after you finish the dynamic analysis. And I'm really happy if some people will it's really hard when you have a, an open source uh, project because you always want to understand what people think about it and if it helped them, what features, what features would they like? And it's really nice if people will, uh, will do it more often, just like comment and have issues or send DMs uh, so I can improve the code and, and continue and add features. Yeah, definitely. I, uh, I'm own, managing my own open source projects. I feel like you don't hear from at least 95% of your users. So uh, I totally appreciate that. So definitely if you're listening to this and if you use this or do give it a try, let her know. I would love that. <laughs> <laughs> so for our listeners who are maybe interested in getting a job where they're doing reverse engineering of code, looking for vulnerabilities, do you have any recommendations for them? Like what, what kinds of things they should be studying or looking into on their own and uh, like how you go about finding a job doing this? So what I think that is really important that people that do reversing not necessarily understand how important it is to understand assembly code. So the first thing that I would recommend for people who wants to start reversing is to write assembly code and not only read it. Because mm -hmm. when you write assembly, you really understand stuff that you don't necessarily understand when you just read it and look at code and look. Today you have so many decompilers, so a lot of the people just decompile the code and don't look at the assembly enough. And I'm from the I'm, I'm from the people that believe that assembly is really important to to know in order to understand the reversing process. And when I mean know, I mean like know how to write assembly. Okay. So this is, I think it's just a tip, but um, I think it will help people um, a lot in this process. The second thing that I think that people should have a lot of patience. Reversing is quite a long process, and if you want to be good at reversing, you need a lot of experience. You need to do stuff, you need to read a lot of code, and it's not an easy job that you can just learn a few days and then be um, a good reverser. So you need to be patient and learn a lot, be up to date with all of the vulnerabilities and stuff that you can find today, and actually be very um, stubborn when you read code and trying to find stuff, because you really need to look at a lot of code and you sometimes look at the same thing more than once or twice. And you need to have your the right state of mind when you do and you start um, working in this field. So, so this is my recommendations. 
it's not like a 90s hackers movie where it's all very exciting and happens in about 10 minutes. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> when you see everything in the, in the in the TV, everything looks so glamorous, like, wow, let's press this like few buttons, everything is just opened for you, and it's exactly the opposite. You <laughs> press a few buttons, and it's not even the beginning. So, <laughs> so it's it's just something that you need to understand before you start, because everyone wants to make this job the most glamorous one, and the fact that, wow, you just like hack to stuff, and it's not like that. You have a lot of work, and you have a lot of code to read, and usually, as I said before, you fail. You're not succeeding. You are not succeeding all the time. You usually fail. You try one lead, it's not ending up. Um, as profitable, so you try something else, and it's a dead end too. And then at the tenth time, you find it, you find something, but it took a few months until you are, you you used all your leads. And actually, it's it's really it's really a state of mind that you need to have. That the job is the the feeling when you succeed something is amazing, but in the process you really need to be um quite prepared for all the obstacles that you will have. I actually love all of these obstacles because <laughs> it's quite interesting when us the more complicated the code is, so I find it more interesting. Mm. It might not be the easiest, but you have more challenge. And what I like in my job is that I have challenge. Right. So if you really like solving problems. And puzzles, puzzles. actually. <laughs> puzzles, yeah. Exactly. Now, you you said that you do strongly recommend spending time writing assembly. Now, yeah. I mean, there's 32-bit Intel, 64-bit Intel, 32-64-bit ARM, MIPS. I mean, there's lots of commonly used processors. What would you suggest? So I would suggest uh, starting with uh, Intel, uh, okay. just because a lot of the tutorial stuff that you have on reversing is uh, written in, on, in Intel, and there is a lot of sources. I also reverse some... Um, let's call it archaic uh, architectures. Mm. And I can say that I know to write assembly code in all of the, on the all of the architectures, but Intel is the basics. ARM is also a good uh, practice because uh, I guess that 886 and ARM are the most uh, common ones. Um, so this is what I would start with. Do you have a recommendation for what kinds of things to do? I mean, for learning? So I guess at the beginning there is some basics programs uh, you can write. I wouldn't start with writing the same code that you write in C++, but you can <laughs> right. focus on basic stuff. At the beginning, like, try to take some numbers, add them, try to do a Fibonacci and stuff like this. And at the end, you can do something more complicated. Um, there is lots of uh, exercise you can try, and actually, if you start with the same uh, exercise that you would do if you want to start uh, programming, I guess if you were doing an assembly, you will eventually be. Um, it, it it will really cover what is what you need for being a, a good reverser. But actually, you you will never be a assembly developer. Um, it's not like what what I mean here. It's just like mm -hmm. to practice and to understand how the, the assembly code looks like. Right. Um, so this is this is what I think. Okay. Another question I had um, earlier, you were saying how you know there's some techniques like anti debugging to help protect a C++ program from reverse engineering. Mm -hmm. Are there any like open source or commercial tools to you know protect your application from reverse engineering that you would recommend? Um, I don't have something specific uh, that I would recommend on. There is lots of articles and blog about it, so you can just like read stuff about it and just uh, implement it. Um, but I don't have something specific that I would recommend on. Okay. 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 Well, Gal, it's been great talking to you today. Um, is there anything else you wanted to go over before we let you go? Actually, no. It was a pleasure to be in your uh, in your episode. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening in as we chat about C++. We'd love to hear what you think of the podcast. Please let us know if we're discussing the stuff you're interested in, 
Or if you have a suggestion for a topic, we'd love to hear about that too. You can email all your thoughts to feedback at cppcast.com. We'd also appreciate if you can like CppCast on Facebook and follow CppCast on Twitter. You can also follow me at Rob W. Irving and Jason at Left to Kiss on Twitter. We'd also like to thank all our patrons who help support the show through Patreon. If you'd like to support us on Patreon, you can do so at patreon.com slash cppcast. And of course, you can find all that info and the show notes on the podcast website at cppcast.com. Theme music for this episode was provided by podcastthemes.com. Site at cppcast.com. Theme music for this episode was provided by podcastthemes.com.